Behaviorists were only interested in observable behavior. What goes on in the mind that creates that observable behavior doesn't even matter. Only observable behavior can change the world. And behavior is learned by adapting to the environment. For example, John Watson. If John Watson offered a rat some cheese, the rat would take the cheese. That's observable behavior. And so would a child take candy. And that's what Watson did. He looked at the behavioral research on animals, Pavlov's research. Behaviorism was widespread by then. And he decided he was going to try it on humans. See how people responded. He has some controversial studies, one with a video that I'm going to show you soon, in which he decided to test behavioral research on infants, specifically one of the babies of one of his uh, assistants. And the research subject, we call him Little Albert, proved to be very controversial. What he did was he wanted to make sure that Little Albert wasn't first afraid of the little bunny to begin with. So he had Little Albert play with the bunny, and everything was great. And then he decided he was going to condition the Little Albert to be afraid of the bunny by ringing a pipe, a really loud noise, over the baby's head every time he saw the bunny, so that he would associate the bunny with that loud noise over his head that scared him. And then he tested to see if the fear response would be generalized to anything that's fuzzy. And eventually, to even clowns because he put on a clown mask and scared the little baby. Pretty soon the little baby was going to be afraid of just about everything. A conditioned fear response. And it's a very controversial study because it's subjecting any participant to trauma, where the harm of the trauma is greater than the benefit of the research study. Then again, it's also something we're learning in the 100 level introduction to psychology. So there must have been some benefit to it. Now, he was fired from his job for ethical reasons, for another, not essentially this study, but for other ethical reasons. And he eventually went to work in advertising. If you've ever seen a beer commercial where there's a girl in a bikini, he figured that if a brand name product was paired with a girl in a bikini, that product would sell better. And he died a very, very rich man. Enter B.F. Skinner, a behaviorist. This is the man who took behaviorism and made it mainstream. He would appear with pigeons that would do amazing things. He wrote books about how to use behaviorism with children. He invented boxes where children would learn things based on behaviorism, where they would learn to... He was a celebrity. And for all his behavioral research and all of his celebrity status, it was still controversial to teach children behaviorism. Because when you're teaching behaviorism, are you really teaching a child to think for him or herself? Still, when we teach teachers how to control classrooms, behaviorism is one of the major things we teach. Now, we've heard of a lot of researchers who studied human actions throughout history, but how do we actually learn what parts of the brain do what functions? In ancient times, what would have people have said about a person who's acting very strangely? Someone who had a mental disorder and talking to no one or hallucinating. Generally speaking, Historically, we would have said the gods have something to do with it, or that person's possessed by demons. In fact, those were the conclusions up until the Renaissance. Because it was unethical to open someone's brain up after they die and see what's wrong. In fact, someone could be burned for it. And again, being burned at a stake is a very good motivation not to do something. But after the Renaissance, when the Catholic Church lost a lot of its power to burn people at stakes, psychologists and medical professionals began to have ideas about how to track down what parts of the brain do what functions. And the primary way they would do that was that they would wait for something to go wrong. Wait until someone had damage to a certain part of the brain, see what functions they weren't capable of, and then when they died, open up their brains and see what part of the brain had damage. They were a morbid bunch, usually waiting for someone to have an accident. Case in point, one mental hospital after the Renaissance had one patient they named Tan. And they named him Tan because that was the only word he could say. Tan, 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 Tan. Tan. It was like dude, or even Hodor. Now there was a doctor named Broca who had an idea what part of the brain was damaged in Mr. Tan. And his plan was to get himself assigned to the mental hospital where Mr. Tan was being held. Six days after Dr. Broca got himself assigned to that hospital, Mr. Tan died. And Dr. Broca dissected his brain and found out that yes, in fact, the part of the brain that he had predicted would be damaged was in fact damaged. And to this day they call that Broca's area, the part of the brain that regulates outgoing speech. Now in another famous story that I'll introduction to psych students here, is about a man named Phineas Gage, who was a construction worker. And during an explosion, a pipe went through his head and landed some distance away, taking a big chunk of his brain with it. 
But Mr. Phineas Gage didn't die. In fact, they wrapped him up and took him to the hospital. And Mr. Phineas Gage decided that if he was going to die that day, he was going to have a pint first. So they went to a bar, drank a pint, then went to the hospital. The hospital fixed him up as best they could and sent him home. And for a while, he seemed normal. But then he began to curse more often and he was unable to control his anger. He became impulsive, got into fist fights, eventually lost his wife and his job. He joined the circus and became part of a sideshow touring the country with the metal rod that went through his head. And we now know that his newfound impulsiveness was because the part of the brain that that pipe took out was part of the frontal lobe responsible for planning and emotional control. The things he no longer had. Throughout the early days of psychology, arguments were the cornerstone of psychological advance. Behaviorists argued with Neo-Freudians. Structuralists argued with pragmatists. Dualists argued with materialists. From the outside, the field of psychology looked like a trash talk main event, with everybody shouting and nobody giving an inch. Enter statistics into psychology. Because scientific research needed a vehicle to convey evidence that people could reasonably consider. Statistics offered that platform. Statistics also allowed for the use of a smaller, randomly chosen sample to represent the effects of a phenomenon in a much larger group or population. And when a smaller population could be used to predict the results of a larger population, we call that inferential statistics. And the invention and application of computers that were fast enough to process lots of information quickly allowed statistics to grow into the foundation for science that it's become. For an example of how statistics can be used as a tool to use the results from a small sample size to represent a larger population, we have an activity. But psychology as a science isn't like chemistry, isn't like a hard science where you have a set amount of chemical A and a set amount of chemical B and when put together you can predict almost 100% of the time what is going to result. Psychology is more complex with a lot more variables that we don't quite understand. So whereas in chemistry 100% is considered a good score, in psychology 70% is considered a pretty significant score a significant result in psychological research. That's why psychology may not always be considered a science, but with adherence to scientific method and new methodologies, we make progress toward being a hard science with every new research study.